And we'll begin lesson five. So the main thing we did last week was compare and contrast, mainly contrast, um, Mordecai and Esther with King Xerxes or King Ahasuerus. Um, and we got through some of them, but we didn't get up to chapter 4. So I've got the text laid out for you, and I've tried to leave a big margin. That first page has a should have a large margin on the left if you want to make any notes. Um, <clears throat> So we're just going to contrast uh, the king with Esther and Mordecai. And we're going to treat Esther and Mordecai kind of as one package deal for today. In the future, we'll look for differences between them. But for right now, we'll just treat them as a, a unit. Okay. Um, would anyone like to read the first two verses? So that's 3.15 and 4.1. Yeah, I know. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict, edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the um, edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, so... Do you notice a contrast between the king's reaction to the edict about killing all the Jews and Mordecai's? One was drinking and having a party and the other one had on sackcloth. Yes, good. Um, <clears throat> sackcloth, mourning, what else? I think he went to the king's gate to be noticed. Would the king wonder what's he doing? Uh, well, the king wouldn't probably see the gate. But he did go to the Jews, too. Yeah. To the people. Um, who did? Mordecai. In these verses? Um, I'm looking at the ESD right now. What does it say? Right, but I read that wrong. right, yeah, but it does. The edict went there, and and, and the Jews react very similarly to Mordecai. Good. Um, so the things that are in contrast to the king is the sackcloth and the mourning. What else? There's a couple other things listed in that that section. Yeah, cared deeply, moved. Yes, good. That's an important one. What else? I think, well, we already talked about sackcloth, so I'll, I'll, while you're thinking about that, I'll mention this. I think the sackcloth is a big one because the whole point of sackcloth is that it's uncomfortable. Uh, it's painful to wear. It's like burlap. So... Um, it's saying, I'm so mentally upset that my bodily, my body is just going to have to be uncomfortable. I'm not going to sit around in comfortable clothes while this horrible thing is happening elsewhere. Right? Well, that would be a constant reminder of why. Right. You know, why yes. I, I heard that that was either camel's hair or... 
Yeah, I don't. I don't actually know. Cow skin, or I think it was kind of like a burlap kind of dress. Right? Yeah. It sounded like it was more like a skin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. I always we think of yeah. burlap. But right. Yeah. I'm not. I don't know what it was made of, but I think the point is that it was. Um, it was not pleasant. It was not no. a fine. <laughs> right. That's the whole point. So, but think about that in contrast to the king who wants good, expensive wine. So there's the um, there's the satisfying your immediate desires and purposefully dissatisfying your immediate comforts and desires. And there's another thing that goes along with that in there. Ashes. Ashes, yeah. Um, uh, I don't think so. I think the ashes were, um, like, if you think about, I mean, they're very dirty, right? So it's a, yeah. So it's a symbol of, um, I'm not going to bathe myself. They were, you know, into oils and wiping everything off, and everything would be oiled and glistening on their body, you know, in ancient times. That's, we usually don't, like, want to have like greasy skin we don't think of that as like clean if your skin is oily but um yeah so um it's another symbol of I'm not going to wash myself. I'm not going to be clean. I'm not going to look nice. So you wouldn't like have like soot all over yourself if you were going to be pres- go to a fancy party, right? So that's another one of those things. Kind of distress. Yeah. And there's one other big one. It's the fasting. Um. So think about why people fast. It's because you say, I'm just going to put away all bodily desires right now and focus on this spiritual desire or this emotional desire or this mental desire. So remember that the contrast between the king's um, his mind and his body, right? His, his reason is um, completely subservient to his body. So, so Mordecai is acting the opposite here, and so are the Jews. You know, this is, this is the right, right thing. In the past, seriously, as I've read this, without the emphasis on what we've learned about the kind of man he was, I used to think maybe he got drunk because he was just trying to forget all the other commandments. You know, which, that's not true. I mean, I'm, but I'm saying what I thought before. Yeah. Maybe he was just getting drunk and didn't want to think about all the yeah um, so I think what's important the most important thing you can learn from this class I mean it's good to learn about the book of Esther but is to take your time and when you think that maybe he's getting drunk for that like write that down why is the king getting drunk here is it to forget question mark and then sit there and think could there be other reasons and then when you've listed the three or four you can think of, think and try to think as many as you can, think which ones make the most sense with the whole story. And you have to, right, just from that passage, you don't know. But you have to keep going. And, and so you leave all these questions. But that's what's been fun, because if you were raised in Sunday school and church, you know, you hear the story, just the general story, and the mm-hmm. story, and so you're reading through the passage, and a lot of times you don't, which I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah, and if you, once you like get this concept, all the stories start to like re come alive. Because you're like, why is there that story about Noah getting drunk, naked, right after the flood? He's like the savior of humanity. And then, uh, and so a lot of times what we do is we're like, well, when I teach this, I'm just going to skip that part. I'm going to tell about the ark and the sacrifices at the end, and that's it. 
and then we're going to skip over his weird drunken thing. So we just don't deal with them or don't think about them. But why is that in there? And so it starts to raise all these questions. So is Noah a good, good, good guy? Maybe, maybe sometimes, maybe. You know what I mean? Why did God choose Noah? Because he was the best? Maybe. You have to start asking. All, it's the same. It just, I mean, there's very few characters who don't have scenes like that. Um, and so all these questions uh, start to come up. And if you're willing to, to just hold them, um, and which also, I was thinking about this, um, because most of the people in our church are retired, um, it's the perfect stage of life to be able to really contemplate. Because most of you know the stories already, um, but you can, you can like, uh, what's that word? Or reflect, you know, and ponder them and think. Let me look at that again. Why is that? Because um, really, that's that's what the biblical stories were meant to do: is to help you like think through it and the different possibilities. And um, <clears throat> so, anyway, um, I encourage that. Um, I know that I'm teaching a class, but but the, the biblical stories were meant to be read and thought about. Um, probably taught also, but the teaching, learning from a teacher doesn't replace just reading the story. I'm going, that's... I don't get that. <laughs> you know? Um, it, and you know, sometimes as a child, you're taught so much about don't question the Bible, take it with mm-hmm. the you know, you grow up in it, and that's what you hear, you know, the Bible, God gave it to us just like it is, and, and that's why I'm enjoying this, because it's a new twist. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everything that you were taught about right. that, but I would just say, it seems like the biblical authors want you, because they're purposely leaving out details that we... And it seems like the detail they leave out are the ones that would be the key to understanding the story. <laughs> Often. You know? Um, so many times. So many characters. Um, we have all these questions about if I just knew why he did that, then I would, would unlock the story. Like, if I just knew why Cain was so mad. We make up reasons. We say it was because he was jealous. Really? How do you know? You know, then I would understand the Cain and Abel story. But the authors, and it, and it's unique to um, Jewish literature, to the Bible. Other ancient stories don't do that. Um, it doesn't mean that the other stories are primitive. It means there's a very specific purpose for omitting crucial details to make you work for it. Um, so it's a, it's a way of educating a whole society. You just write a story, it's their only piece of literature, and they're all reading it, and they're all, after they read it, they're like, well, why, why did this happen? Or why did, why did Abraham do that? Why did Abraham do that same thing again? He tell, lies about his wife being his sister again, yeah. a second time. And so... I mean, you can imagine if over the course of your life there's going to be one time at which you're going to say to your friend when you're talking about it or, or in your mind when you're thinking about it, what an idiot to make the same moral mistake again. And then, from there to, have I ever made the same moral mistake again? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and some people can't ever make that jump that's the critical one to, to self-reflection but anyway uh, we're getting far afield here okay so big contrast between Xerxes and Mordecai there um, 
Donna, can you read four through five? Can I ask you a question? Actually, just four. Yeah. I've always heard eunuch and eunuch. What is the correct pronunciation? Eunuch. Okay. When Esther's eunuchs and male and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Okay. Hold on right there. Um... Is there a contrast there that you see? Between Esther and Mordecai? Uh, between Esther or Mordecai and the king. Yeah, this is going to be all about the king today. Well. Well, again, she showed concern. Mm -hmm. Now, was her great distress just for Mordecai, or was it for... Yeah, it was. If you read verse 5, I should have let you read verse 5 also. Go ahead and read verse 5 now. Then Esther summoned Haddock, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So she doesn't know about the edict. Okay. Um, when she seen him in sackcloth, she knew something was wrong in the morning. Yeah, she knew something was wrong. Well, she didn't see him, but... Um, she heard about him. Her eunuchs and female attendants. Now... It may be that normally he gets closer to her and she actually can see him with her eyes, especially if he's a eunuch too. Um, there's hints uh, that Mordecai's a eunuch too. Um, and this time he's not, he can only, it says, verse 2, but he only went as far as the king gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. So, not only is the king not wearing anything uncomfortable, you can't even be around him. He doesn't even want to see anybody mm -hmm. who's mourning. He doesn't want to have to deal with thinking about all oh, the sad people out there. You're not even allowed to be in the, through the king's gate with that. So he's further away than he usually is. Um, and so she hears from her eunuchs and female attendants. They told her about, about Mordecai. She's in great distress. So she, yeah, Somebody said... She shows concern for him, unlike the king. She's not like, don't tell me about it if he's in sackcloth. I don't want to hear about anything sad. That would be what the king would do. Um, uh, she sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. She tries to rectify the situation, and he won't. He refuses it. What do you think about that? It reminds me of a child that doesn't want to see their parents sad, and they usually will try to make you happy. They, you know, what they, would make me happy? This toy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's very sweet. Uh, and then what about him not accepting it? Yes. Oh yes, he's not going to accept clothes when this is going on. But um, what about a contrast to the king? Yeah, the king is not the type to refuse a physical comfort, is he? Um, so it's, I guess. I guess it's a small token of self-control by Mordecai, even when he's offered nice things. You also have to remember that um, clothing is a huge theme in this book. Um, uh, you know, you remember the key scene where he's leading them around on the horse, wearing the king's robe, and then um, and then later when he's elevated to basically prime minister he gets these special purple robes and um, there's all kinds of um, references if you if you read through and see what I did was I printed out the whole book like this and I always do this and taped it all together so I can see the whole book all at once hanging on my wall and I'll just take a colored pencil and I'll go through this time I'm going to think about clothing the whole book and every time it mentions clothing circling it in a certain color um, and Sometimes um, you think, maybe this is a theme, and you go through and you're like, 
okay, no, this is not, this is not <laughs> enough. But um, you start to notice there's certain things that come up a whole lot in one book, you know. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, why? Why emphasize clothing? Um, and we'll get more into that later. I think but, it's interesting the way we, they communicate and, and the messages to each other. I mean, of course, they don't have what we have today. But it seems like everybody still got the news <coughs> through all this verbal communication. Well, yeah. Well, look what she says. She sends, so she sends them out with the clothes. They come back. And he didn't take them. Then she sends out back one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her and order him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. That There's this important contrast with King Xerxes there. What do you think that is? Yeah. The king doesn't even... He doesn't even... He doesn't even know which race of people he just ordered killed. Oh, yeah. Well, everyone he's ever... I mean, he probably knows some Gentiles, but pretty much all his social circles and all his relatives will all be affected. Every single Jew in the whole known world. Yeah, especially um, in a culture that was so family dominated. Yeah. Um, like when we hear about, oh, the girl's taken from her family, but like she's going to be a princess, she's going to have new acquaintances, is a much worse situation. Um, maybe if you have kids and grandkids um, and you think about like your whole clan. Imagine if you found out every single one of them was going to die, be murdered. The babies, the kids. Um, you can imagine why he's, um, yeah, upset. So, but she wants to find out why. So that's important, um, contrast with the king. And then there's a whole bunch of, um, in the next couple verses, um, Anyone want to read uh, 6 through 8? Or, yeah, 6 through 8? Mm -hmm. So Haggad went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury to, for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther the expenditure. He told him the instruction to go to the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Okay, so you've got uh, Mordecai tells her everything that happened. Um, Mordecai told him to tell her everything that happened to him. So, he may tell her his involvement, his little um, dispute with uh, Haman over bowing, um, but including the exact amount of money, he promised all the details, and he also gave him a copy of the text of the edict, the edict for their annihilation, was completely wiped out. Um, So, I mean, think about the importance of her getting that information um, and the fact that she actually has a copy of the edict, which makes it seem like um, she can probably read. Yeah. And the king can't. <laughs> um, and if the king can read, which would be unlikely, um, he doesn't care to. 
um, explain it to her, and to instruct her to go to the king's presence and to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. And there's something else there. That's all about knowing and finding out, which is in contrast to the king. But this, uh, he told whatever that guy's name is, Hathak, to instruct her to do two things. Oh, three things. Go into the king's presence, beg for mercy, and plead with him for her people. Um, Go instruct and plead, right? Well, no, the instructions instruct her to Go, beg, and plead. Um, so there was no question of what. It wasn't like Esther had to figure that out. Right. Um, and uh, this might seem a little bit too obvious, but... This means that Mordecai is making a plan. It's a pretty simple, basic plan. And also problem solving. We've got a problem, and the only solution I can see is Esther goes and talks to the king. She's the only one who can go into his presence, has access to his presence. Now, she actually doesn't. She's going to tell him, actually, it's illegal for me to go in if I'm not called. Um, but, uh, so it's very rudimentary level planning and problem solving, which are two things the king doesn't do. The king, if there's a problem, the king asks someone else, oh, what can we do about this? Um, my wife won't come. Well, what should I do? I'm... Uh, I'm really mad at this guy. What should I do? Well, why don't you hang him? You know what I mean? Now I'm sad that I don't have a queen. I, <laughs> what should I do? Um, so, um, let's... Uh, 9 through 11, basically, she just sends back and says, well... It's against the law for me to just show up in the king's presence. The king's presence is also a theme in this book. It talks about it a lot. Um, Vashti was banished from the king's presence. Um, it comes up again and again in the book. Um, and she says, the last line of 11 is, 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Um... So, uh, it's so messed up that the king has all these concubines. Um, I, it's just hard to imagine being married to someone like that. Um, what, how that would make her feel. But, regardless, um, verse 12 um, would anyone, Ellie, could you read 12 through 13? Just 12 and 13. No, 12 and 14, sorry. Okay. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father father's family will perish and who knows but that you have come to your royal position at such a time as this okay so this is a really key passage here um, what are we seeing about Mordecai with these words what are we learning about him it is Stern. Okay, good. Uh, something like determination, which the king doesn't really exemplify. Um, good. What else? It doesn't say God, but I believe that he is listening to God. 
What do you mean? Yes, what do you mean? As, as far as, as deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, God would do, you know, answer that in another way. And also that who knows, but you, this is why you are in that position. Okay, yeah, so two things that might be references to something like God. Um, number one, if you remain silent, help will come some other way. So that shows what? That Mordecai has what? Faith. Yeah, faith. 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 It doesn't say faith in God, mm -hmm. but it does seem to mean faith. And he's telling her, if you don't do this, you know, the psychos, there's a blessing if you do lose something. She'll lose that blessing because God needs somebody else to do it and get a blessing out. Yeah. So a couple things. Number one, don't think you're going to escape just because you're in the yeah. palace. <laughs> Number two, if you remain silent, um, God will, or somehow, deliverance will come some, from somewhere else. But um, now I like what you said about losing the blessing. But I think it's a little bit further than just losing a blessing. He says, uh, deliverance, this is 14, for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Now that means the rest of the Jews will get rescued somehow, but you won't. Um, so, um, I don't know how he knows that. What do you think? Where is that coming from? It's coming from the Lord. God's telling him. God's because even though he didn't say God, you know, the next verse says, and who knows that you have come to your world position for such a time as this. To me, that indicates that there was a plan by a higher power at some time. Yeah. There was a, yeah, a plan or a purpose for why you're here. We... This is important. We don't know what that plan is. That's why I think God's not actually speaking to him. Because he says, who knows? If God said, this is why I made your adopted daughter queen. So that she could rescue it. If God said that, then he would say, this is why you're here. But he, he said, who knows? Maybe this is why you're here. So he believes that there is a purpose and a meaning to these things that happen to us in life. But we don't get to know what they are. Esther, of every book in the Bible, is the most similar to our, our life experience. We know God is there. there but he doesn't audibly speak to us. Typically. Or at least not to me. I would like it if he did. I'm open to it, but he hasn't so far. Um... And these things happen, and like sometimes I'm like, why would this happen? No answer comes. So, Mordecai is saying, we don't know why, but maybe this is why. So you better, you better take advantage of what you have, this position you have. Um... So he's got some kind of faith, possibly determination. Um, he's contemplating the purpose and meaning of circumstances, which the king, there's no evidence that the king's ever doing that. And then one last thing in there is that Mordecai faces reality, um, which is important. Oh. I mean, what do you have to lose? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it's kind of last, last two chapters. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I never thought of that. You're right. He sh <laughs> I would have said to her, you're going to die anyway. Well, I guess that is what he says. You're going to die anyway. Um, yeah, that is what he says. You're going to die anyway, so you might as well do this. And if you remain silent, 
You might be the only one who dies, you and your family. Now, um, was, was he worried about? The whole, I mean, he was worried about the whole race being erased. You know, all the Jews would be erased. Yeah. Now, yes, yes, exactly. Now, there's two things that come up here. Um, so far, we've been talking about Mordecai like he is this great man because that's the way he's always been presented to us, right? In sermons and lessons and things. But most of the time, whenever you see these characters, and you're like, that means that he was listening to God, or that means that he was doing the right thing. Most of the time, there's this double-edged thing, like, well, actually, if you think about it another way, he could be a terrible person. What caused this edict to happen? Him not bowing down. Now, we have to go back to that and say, why wasn't he bowing Was it a good reason or a bad reason that he didn't bow down? Was it just like, I'm not going to bow down to that guy? And people have come up with all kinds of crazy explanations to why, well, probably... Haman had a little pin of a statue of a false god. And so that's why he didn't want to do it. Well, maybe, but the author doesn't say that. Right? So, that goes back to that, but we don't know why he didn't bow down, but let's move to this. Is he just really trying to help out his nation? Or is he also thinking, if we all die, I gotta do something about that. I said, that my own personal vendetta against that guy that I hate is going to wipe out the entire race of God's covenant people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. But so yeah. So could there be some guilt here? And he's like, I gotta fix this, and this is my only hope to fix it. Now, if so. Remember, I don't know if you remember last week I said it's like dominoes. Um, when, you're, when you're like, why didn't he do that? I don't know. If I just knew why he bowed down, because it, it, cause it goes two different courses. It's like you have to figure out which domino to knock down, because if you knock down this one, if he bowed down for an arrogant reason, or he refused to bow down to Haman for an arrogant reason, then this is his fault. And so he's not being super noble, being like, I need to try to save my people. It's not nearly as noble if it's all his fault. Then, when he says, if you remain silent at such a time as this, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Suddenly, there's a whole other meaning potential meaning to that verse if Mordecai is not a good person and he's not faithful what could that other meaning be? Could it could it be a threat? Like so you can read it as, and I think it's probably right, but we need to at least look at it. You can read it as Mordecai is a good guy and he trusts God. Someone's going to rescue us. Or you can read it as, I started this. I'm going to find some way. He is an official. I'm going to find some way to thwart this edict. But if it's not you then you and everyone in your family is going to perish. That's a really dark way to look at Mordecai, right? Yeah. That's, that's a threat. Yeah. Um, but I'm not saying that that is the way. I'm just saying that could be. It's conceivable that, that that's a threat. But even if it's not a threat like, I'm going to kill your family, it's a threat in a different way, a more noble way. Isn't it? I mean, it, no, you better speak up because if you don't, your whole family is going to die. Now, whether 
they would die because I would kill them, or they're going to die because some just, I don't know, what would you call that, karma? I mean, I don't mean the karma in the Buddhist sense. I mean, I mean karma in the sense of God's poetic justice. I put, he could be saying, and from God's point of view, Esther, I put you in this position so that you could rescue the Jews when this threat comes up. And you didn't do it. So I'm going to rescue them with someone else, and you are going to be punished. So it's either a threat from him or a threat saying, um, like, I don't know, from God, or what's a good parallel to this? Um, you had said he, he, he faces reality, and it just seems like he's, he's facing reality, telling it like it is. Yeah, it would be like this. If you say to somebody, hey, I know your friends tell you to just use your credit card to go on this trip. But I'm telling you, if you do that, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. Because you're going to go on this trip, and you're going to rack up thousands and thousands of dollars, and you're going to get back and think about your job. It's not a very good job. You're going to be paying off the minimum payments, and it's, then it's going to get harder, and then you're going to, well, I have this credit card. I'll use it for this one little time for my groceries, and it's going to grow and grow and grow. You're kind of telling that person a threat, right? You're kind of saying, don't do this because it's going to destroy you. And think about how many lives have been destroyed by credit cards. Whenever I see someone who's like six years old taking out the trash at McDonald's, I'm just like, honestly, you don't know, but a lot of the time the reason is they made foolish decisions when they were young. Sometimes it's not their fault. But anyway, but what, what I'm saying is he's, it's, it's some type of a threat. Either God's going to punish you, or worse, I'm going to see that it happens. Probably not that one. But I'm just saying, there's always like a dark way to read these characters. And, and so, the, so each story, when you don't know, don't make a choice yet, because you have to wait and see. And sometimes once you figure out one thing, then it starts to, oh, that sheds light on this story. And then it's like a chain reaction to understanding the whole book. But go ahead, go ahead Donna, what were you going to no, say? No, I was just going to say, that was a good example that you gave us, but that didn't have a divine or a, a, a godly punishment for that. And that's kind of what I looked at this. Okay, okay. But I really did feel like he said, you know, because of the time there was a plan that that it was a threat, but it would be whatever divine power was out there, even though okay. recognized You're right, you're right. See, that's why I looked at proof. A lot of times see they said that he was, he was a godly man, but when I read this, it's just like God is set it up and he's obeying God by telling him to do this. Right, it, it never says whether or not he's a godly man. It never mentions God. Um, it does say he didn't know, but, you know, it, it, it kind of infers. It kind of infers, is, yeah, it does. So you're right. Just you're, being safe. <laughs> no, you're right. That was not a great example. It would be better if it was something like... Um, uh, the person was thinking about borrowing money from the mafia. You're like, look, even if it all works out and you get this money back and you get involved in this group, God is not happy that you're borrowing this stolen money. No matter how you dice it, it's going to be bad for you if you do this. Right? Whether it's just that you can't pay them back and they break your knuckles or, you know, I don't know what the mafia does to people, but... Um, Okay. Wow. Yeah. You're going to wake up with a horse head in your bed. I don't know. <laughs> wow. 
And that's a good example. Yeah. So anyway, you're saying whether it just turns out bad for you or whether God punishes you, it's going to be bad if you do this. And in this case, doing this is protecting your own skin by not doing this. Okay. So. Um, okay. So then she says um, in verse 16, okay, gather all the Jews in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. Don't eat or drink for three days. Um, sometimes actors will not drink for like 48 hours or 72 hours and their body gets all like shrunken so they can play a scene. Um, uh, yeah, it is like it's uh, shocking when you see like... Um, Jean Valjean, uh, Hugh Jackman, in the beginning scene of Les Mis when he's all like skinny and stuff, that's because he didn't, he didn't drink water for three days to do that scene. And then he drank, and he's like muscular and strong for the rest of the movie. But anyway, it's a traumatic thing to do that. Um, so very different from the king here. And she's going to fast. Um, and then I'll go, even though it's against the law, I'll go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. So this is a key, a key thing. Um, she is breaking the law to go into the king's presence. Vashti broke the law by not going into the king's presence. Um, yeah, well, we don't have time. There's a whole lot of things contrasting to Vashti here. She prepares a banquet for him. Vashti was going to her own banquet. Uh, she goes to a banquet with the king, a very small private banquet, just her and the king and Haman. And Vashti won't go to this huge public banquet with tons and thousands of people. There's all these um, comparisons and contrasts with her and Vashti. Um, yeah, we don't have time today. But um, one last thing in chapter 4, verse 17. Donna, can you read that? To the very bottom of the page. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. What What do you think about that verse? It had to be a faith thing. Why? Because he didn't know what was going to happen. Okay, good, yes. Didn't they, you know, it says when they fast a lot, prayed when he wanted God to show something? Well, when they had a request, whether that was guidance or, in this case, deliverance, protection. Yeah. yeah. And the New Testament also. Yeah. Um, Mordecai also listened to a woman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his daughter, no less. Right? Now, she is the queen now. But um, this is a personal, interpersonal thing. Uh Esther does deal with this topic of authority. I mean, that's one of the major things. Authority, political authority, and family authority, husband-wife authority, father-daughter authority, um, men and women. Remember that edict in chapter 1? Every man is going to be master in his own home. Um, and Mordecai didn't we know this from uh, previous chapters, Mordecai didn't raise his daughter in a sense of, you have to do it, I said so. And I'm the master of this home. Because we know that because she still obeyed him even after she didn't have to anymore, even after she was out of the house. Um, whenever someone is controlled by sheer power, as soon as they're free from that power, they're done with that power, right? Yeah, but when she's when she's raised with 
wisdom and love, then even after she doesn't have to obey him anymore, she still does. And now he, of course, he doesn't have to obey her, but um, he carries out all her instructions. So the king, the way he controls things is with his royal authority. Send out the messengers. I'm the king, right? But the way Mordecai and Esther, I, get, I don't know if control is the right word, but the way they instruct other people is not in that kind of a power move. And that's a super important um, contrast in this book. Because one of the big themes is power and control. And when he's so controlling, right? The king is so controlling. Um, it totally backfires. I mean, everyone else is controlling him. Um, I think it really, she and Esther have a lot of faith in going to go the king. She can get killed by going to front there. You know. And I would think that she's been going to load her protective and says, well, I'm going to do it. Yeah. But it's very important that she says, if I perish, I perish. Yeah. She doesn't know if God will protect her. I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast. Well, it doesn't say pray, but I'm going to fast for three days, probably implies prayer. And then we'll see what God does. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Right, but yeah. But it's just, it's just, it's just a, a key component that she doesn't know. And because, think about, I mean, think about um, uh, Lynn, not Lynn Major, Lynn Bennett. If you know stuff about her situation and all the things on her and her husband, his, uh, his broken uh, neck and all that. Um, God never spoke to her from heaven saying, here's why. He doesn't know. And that's the way it is for all of us. Suffering comes, we lose loved ones, we have pain, we have all kinds of burdens and financial difficulties, and we don't know why. And that's really what, that's what the book of Job is about. You, you don't get to know why. Job never finds out why. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she never, if you would have said when she was a little girl or however old she was, when she paralyzed, she finds out, I'm never going to walk again, I'm never going to move my arms again. You would have said, well, you know what? Fuck up, because God's going to use it in a great way. Yeah. This, they're like meaningless words, right? Um, but, uh, that, I mean, that's, Did he know her life was in danger? You know, that a, she had to go through all of that. He, to, uh, I mean, she told him. She told him. Her, yeah, it but, seems like he didn't. Yeah. That's what I was wondering, because, I mean, to me, it was a simple request to him, but she knew that she could leave. Yeah. Know, because of all the rules and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, in fact, he didn't even have to do anything unless, the rule is, if you just come into the king's presence, you die, unless the king gives that pardon thing. Um, so that's, the king's presence was very protected. That's another, um, that's another um, reference to that theme with the sackcloth and, or even just coming in there. Um, and obviously, people who are around the king can control the king. As long as they don't let him know that they're Because <laughs> obviously, Haman only cared about the king's interest. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it's just the way it was. I don't know. <laughs> I just have one thing. It's kind of like playing devil's advocate, but you were talking. 
talking about Mordecai uh, not bowing down to Haman. But when I think of Haman, I mean, I think he was very manip manipulative. He was just so egotistical. And I, he hated the Jews to begin with. Uh huh. That's so true. So that just happened to be that one thing that was the key for him to get rid of all the Jews. It just seems like he would have done something as far as the Jewish nation was concerned, otherwise, <coughs> because the king kept elevating him. Mm, I see and what you're he saying. He had more and more power. All the well, time. this is a multicultural court, and the king had to command all the officials to bow down to Haman. Mm -hmm. So that might be a clue that he was not liked in general. <laughs> That's true. You know? And all the other all the other ones were like, Mordecai, why aren't you bowing down? Like we all all of us big shots who sit at the king's gate and you know, we all do. And he's like, I'm not bowing to that guy. So it, it just it doesn't say why. That, that is super important. The very author, that might be the biggest thing that's left unanswered in this book, is why doesn't he bow down? Um, and so we want to leave that unanswered, because that's how the author leaves it. But it doesn't mean we don't try to think, could it be this? Could it be this? Could it be he did something? Could it be Mordecai knew he was anti-Semitic? I mean, obviously... Just calling him an Ega guy. Um, yeah. I know. Yes. I know. So much. That's a good story. So much to contemplate. So, um, yeah, we are going to um, try, you can see on the next page, next week we're going to try to compare and contrast Haman with Xerxes. We have time. We'll get more into Haman's character. Haman is a little bit more complex than the king.